do this? We do this by talking about and espousing safe sleep education as well as breastfeeding education to the men that we serve. We have a couple of men here I've known for a few years again, Brother Javin Foreman and Brother Chris White. Uh, we have Fathers Incorporated, which is a nationally known organization, which Javin Foreman represents with the Gentle Warriors Academy, has been doing this work for quite a while. And Chris White that I met in the rooms. As a matter of fact, he was in the room, I believe received in training when I was going in as a trainer. But we have since maintained a good, fruitful and productive relationship in this space. And they're invited here this eve this afternoon just to let you know about their work and the journey in their work. So without further ado, Chris, Javin, either one of you can take it. Sure, sure. So I'll start at least introduce myself. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank Maternal Health Learning Innovation Center uh, for hosting this. And of course, all my family at Robe and Rose. You know, it's really an honor you know, particularly to have this many people to come in on a Father's Day weekend to talk about something that I'm so passionate about, that I know Chris is so passionate about. So I myself, I've uh, been doing fatherhood work for the past 15 years. Started out in Chicago as a case manager for teen fathers. In fact, I'm a father of three myself now. Um, and at that time I had no children. So, you know, I had a ton of teens running around that claimed me as their dad. I was probably seven or eight years older than those guys, but they kind of introduced me, you know, to the whole fatherhood space. Uh, from there, I went on to uh, run some programs at Chicago Public Schools that dealt with youth violence. So I always was kind of in that youth development space. It wasn't until Fathers Incorporated came calling with an OFA grant a few years ago um, with an opportunity to jump back in the space. So I um, put my best foot forward and could not wait to jump back in the space because the one thing I've found as we'll talk today is that I do believe that fatherhood, you know, responsible fatherhood in particular is a linchpin for many things we face in society. So I'm really looking forward to a spirited conversation today to learn from you all and kind of tell you about my project, what we're doing, and of course our partnership over at Road. Chris, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Javin. Yes, my name is Chris White. I'm executive director of Father Movement. And I, I did meet Carl Root at uh, Clayton County um, Healthy Start here in Georgia. And I was definitely very impressed with him and um, you know his work that he does. I came into this work uh, about 12 years ago, actually in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where I'm from. And I was actually a client first and foremost. Um, I was seeking out services, um, going through a custody battle. And um, shoot, I was put out of a, a NICU unit um, way back when. So I, I definitely experienced some of the barriers and challenges. And it really has inspired me and made me very passionate about helping fathers be involved. So from Minneapolis, um, working as a volunteer, then working with programs uh, such as Urban Ventures programs in Minneapolis, coming down here working with Timer Inc., uh, Roosevelt Muhammad, and um, then, you know, starting my own 501c3 nonprofit and working still in the maternal child health space and working with fathers. Sure. So, uh, Brother Ruth, do you want us to jump straight into presentations? Would you like to uh, open it up with, a, with um, some initial thoughts? How would you like us to proceed? Yeah, let me let me just frame it a little bit with an initial thought. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Brother Javin, for for that space. Listen, I, uh, I I believe that fatherhood is the answer to many of the ills, as Javin mentioned, of society. You know, responsible fatherhood contributes to the well-being of society as a whole. And uh, because we do the work in this space, we recognize the many barriers and the awesome amount of resources that it takes really to prop a man up to be able to do what he's supposed to be doing in society. Because his role as protector, provider, preparer, all of those things were kind of just slumped onto him because of his gender, okay? And uh, what we have to do now is we have to pivot. Like the pandemic, COVID-19 caused us all to pivot. 
We have to pivot now as men in this fatherhood space. And uh, uh, some of the younger people, they call them metrosexuals. That Those are the men who are not as male chauvinistic as those men of the past, like the baby boomers and those before the baby boomers. That was a toxic kind of masculinity. Well, and I, I won't say toxic, an untaught type of masculinity. But today, because of men like Javin and Chris, men are being taught a very healthy form of masculinity that's very useful today. And that's why we're here. And I want to just jump in by saying, uh, we have three objectives. One of those objectives is to talk about the power of partnerships and how we leverage partnerships to get the work done. And then we want to talk about what it looks like going forward into the future as we leverage the power of these collaborations. And then a little bit about the barriers that men face being able to perform the so socially imputed role of father, provider, priest, prophet, and king, especially when he doesn't have the necessary support to be able to do it as it relates to maternal and child health. So uh, you all have a tall order today, but I know you all can handle it. That's why you're here for this panel. And uh, whichever one you want to start, please jump in. We just want to share the three objectives and we want to leave them with a powerful and impactful, life-changing fatherhood message. Sure. Chris, would you want to start? Sure. So just, just for clarity, so we'll go ahead and um, start with the panel questions. And then I believe we do each have slides just shedding a little more light on our programs that we can share at the end. Is that how you guys want to do it, Carl? Yes. Okay, got it. So um, it, it as far as uh, the need for partnerships go, um, one thing that I do want to speak to, yes, of course, I agree, you need to have these partnerships in order to provide true wraparound services for an individual and give them like best in class services, you have to involve partners, you're not going to be the best at everything. Um, and, and if you try to be a one stop shop, you're really doing the client a disservice. So um, the partnerships are, are vital. They are necessary for uh, the success of your client. So um, that's something that we look to do um, in our work is make sure that we are partnering up with individuals and uh, joining associations, um, collabor collaborations such as um, Fathers Matter ATL. Fathers Matter ATL is really a group of um, Georgia-based, primarily Georgia servicing, I'll say, uh, agencies, state organizations that want to improve fatherhood and fatherhood services. And so with that Fathers Matter ATL, there are seven um, committees that work to tackle specific issues that have been identified by the um, committees, the coalition. Um, to try to improve fatherhood. And so that's just one, one way in which we really collaborate, we share resources. Um, this is something that I can uh, sit in a meeting with uh, Carl or Wesley on or Javin, and we can discuss what we're doing, share best practices, and really come up with a really good plan that leverages all our collective resources. And go ahead, Javin, I'll, I'll yeah, pass so the mic. Yep. So I'll elaborate on that. I don't even think Rogue knows this, but um, project that I'm the project director of, um, this is our second year in service. But one of the beautiful things they did for me upon startup, jumping back into this space, we had these sort of informal uh, kind of men's groups, but it was also practitioners in the space where we'd get together. I think, uh, Brother Wesley, it might have been, was it once a week, at least once a month, we'd get together and just talk. There were practitioners from Cincinnati, various places. For, so for us, it was just brotherhood a lot of times. We'd talk about the work we were doing. Uh, Brother Wesley would give us time to kind of talk about, hey, what, what resources do you need? And I don't think they noticed because I may not have talked about this, but it was something that was said in one of the meetings by a brother out of Cincinnati. I don't know why I can't think of his name right now, but he actually did a training for us for my team a few months back. But essentially when my project started, we had a blank slate where um, Office of Family Assistance gave us a pot of money and they said, you all are to serve fathers, you teach them a curriculum for six to 10 weeks, 
And beyond that, you can do what you need to do to adhere your mandates. In the first year, you need to have 100 dads pass through the door, 90% completion, so on and so forth, right? So as I came in, the grant was written before I came in. So they just said, hey, we'll get these guys in. We'll teach them the curriculum, no gift cards in, you know? So in my mind, I'm like, what will be the incentives, you know, for these dads to participate? I know we could advertise on radio, go out in the community with flyers. I think our curriculum was great, but I'm like, let's be real. Who's going to sign up? And this was still during COVID time. It takes six to 10 weeks, two nights a week to just learn this curriculum that we think is great. And so what one of the brothers said on the call was he said, make sure you're hitting what these dads pain points are. Make sure you're giving them something that's real to them that they need. And so what I landed on was that these dads in Georgia in particular need assistance with child support, visitation and legitimation. So now I had to figure out how are we going to provide those? That's not necessarily what, what um, Fathers Incorporated did at the time. This was our first time going down the path of direct service. But I say that to say it was through this partnership that I hit my sweet spot in the project. And now, as you all will get to see later in the presentation, I'll show you my numbers. This year, we're charged with serving 200 guys going on September 1st all the way through October 1st, a lot of the um, preceding October 1st. We've already hit our numbers. I have a call. I've already graduated 143 dads right now in these six week cohorts. And I have 90 guys waiting to be in my mid July cohort. So I'm going to blow these numbers out of the water, but it's hats off to Robe putting that partnership in place, thinking about who's out here, not just serving themselves. When Robe gets a grant, they reach out and say, hey, who else, who else can, would like to be a part of this? These are the opportunities that we have. They're famous for doing that at both Robe and Robe. So it naturally builds this collaboration where you don't have to have a standing meeting on the calendar. If I have an event, I'll just text Carl Wesley, Dr. Bug, whoever, and say, hey, we're having this event, come out and support them. They may not be there at the start, but you'll see them kind of creep in and pass through on the way to the next thing that they have to do. So just that support gives us confidence when we talk about partnerships. And the last thing I'll say, I think one mistake that people make when they look at partnerships, particularly, if it's a partnership with a big civic organization. We had an opportunity to get um, to get referrals to come in from court systems, child support, you know, hospitals, anybody you could think of. But one thing I understood from doing this work on the ground is that when you get referrals or you, you um, kind of rely on that to be your main referral source, you become an extension of that referral source. You have to work really hard to change this guy's mindset about who you are and what your organization is. Are you a probation officer? You know, I used to work in the juvenile courthouse with teens on probation. So if I took a referral from there, I'm looked at as an extension versus we went out and we'll talk about some of my recruitment strategies that I found and worked with dads. We just went out to radio and we, we put it out. So I beat him to the before this guy makes it to the courthouse. So he's at the courthouse. Now he's hearing my ad as he's parking. He's calling. So I don't have to deal with any you know, leftover residue that may have happened somebody else the way they serve clients. But again, partnerships are extremely vital, the right types of partnerships, but I don't think we can get reliant, you know, on partnerships to do your job. I think partnerships should kind of strengthen what it is that you do. That, that's a great point. Um, when, you, when you do receive a referral from child support system, or even uh, in our work in uh, Healthy Start programs, you know, oftentimes we have to tell them, in fact, every time, we are not affiliated with child support. Um, and, and the reason why we do that is because there's a fear for many men that if I get involved, if, I, if I'm on paper, right, if I put my name to paper in the system, then all these other things are coming at me, uh, namely child support, possibly even legal ramifications. So there's, um, there's a reason why a lot of men don't report as being part of a household. And so um, you, need to, you need to define that really quickly and say, no, we are not reporting to them. We are not affiliated with them in any sort of way. This is not going to, your involvement in our program is not going to impact your housing, uh, your income in any sort of way. We're not here to do that. And we can do that. We can tell people, but it's still something that's tough to overcome for some. You can just tell. You know, you can just tell. Um, and then uh, just to piggyback on the other um, other thing that you said that I think is brilliant, which is what what can we really um, anchor to? 
Like, what is their greatest need? And, and we found that if we have a dad that has a need, uh, and this may just be a relationship issue, you know, like they're just, it's, they're unsatisfied with their relationship. Those folks are more likely to participate, come, and they're, they're some of your best participants in your groups and in your programming. Um, another thing with partnerships is employment. We know that that's, you know, oftentimes issue number one, self-reported issue number one for fathers. Um, I don't know if I would go as far to say that it is the most important thing, but to many fathers, they do feel that it directly impacts your identity as a man to be able to provide for your children and your family. And then a lot of other issues stem from that, right? If you're not able to do that, maybe you're not as involved as a father because you don't feel like you have the position to do so because you're not bringing home the bacon. So um, recognizing this and always having an issue of finding employment for our fathers with the partnerships we do have, uh, we actually formed a, um, an apprenticeship. And it's a training program that puts fathers in position, unskilled fathers in position to have a livable wage where they can support a family and be proud of the work that they do and the money that they're bringing home. Um, also, uh, I've even been discussing in our um, committee through um, Fathers Matter ATL, developing a, an apprenticeship for fatherhood practitioners because we know that that's an issue as well with a lot of programs. Um, maybe Fathers Inc. would agree um, that it's hard to not only find these men that do the work, but to retain them as well. And so um, we're trying to create a system that will bring more talent into this space and will retain them. Yeah, you know what, and you said something really important, Chris. I'll share this insight um, and my data will point to it a little bit later. But when we first started the project, um, we said housing and, uh, and employment would be the two largest things that these dads would need, right? So we went out and we ramped up, found partnerships, you know, in those spaces. But the other thing that you said that was really important, Chris, is that it's not just about any job because you can go out and you can help, help a guy find a job, right? I remember working with teens when I was, was serving the teen fathers. I would tell them I can help you find a job, but right now, young guy, you don't have the skills to keep a job, right? But what you said is really important. We could help a dad find a job at Amazon. They're hiring all day at Amazon warehouses, right? But what we'd rather be able to do is, is to what you're saying, Chris, help them get into a space where it's, it's a job that's in a growth industry. So that's one of the things that we were cognizant of. But I'll tell you what my data pointed to as the guys came in. Right now in my cohorts, over um, about 143 uh, dads that have come in our ecosystem this year um, to get towards this graduation, 67% were employed. So what we found was, and I'll tell you how we got to that, probably in year one, it was probably less, more, more like 54, 49%, something like that. But how we got to that, I tweaked my advertising because what I found is that if I really push towards dads who are in triage, who needed jobs that bad, what's the chance of them sticking with me for six to 10 weeks to go through this cohort with me, right? So you'd have to address these guys real pain point. How can you pay attention in this class when really you're suffering, you know, sort of day to day, not to say we won't find another way to serve them, you know, um, but how do we serve them in a relevant way? So we tweaked it. And so what we found is our ratio last year took us about, 24 guys to produce one graduate to go through and you know kind of rifle through and some guys will start and stop um now we're about uh one to every six to eight i believe it is to, to uh, produce a graduate so i think it's also targeting the uh the right people for your intervention whatever it is that you do and not just being this blanket we also said if a guy is experiencing homelessness we may not be the, the best resource for him with what we're offering in this FIRE program. Um, and I saw a question come in here. Uh, what are some lived experience barriers you all encounter with clients' fathers? You know, and those, those are some great things. And I'll tell you, as I'm thinking about these data points, and it kind of speaks to barriers, but it's this. The number one thing I think our dad's getting, we just had a graduation, uh, we were at a park, had to go through a whole bunch of, a bunch of licensing and getting these permits and everything, but we struggled through it just to do an outside event and it was amazing. 
But as you can imagine, these guys have been virtual six to 10 weeks in these cohorts with each other. And when they saw each other, it was like a huge reunion. And sometimes they weren't in the same cohort necessarily, but they knew of each other. But these are guys kind of in this parallel universe doing the same work at the same time. For them, it was the brotherhood. It was the brotherhood and the support, knowing they have 15, 20, 30 other dads that were in their cohort that are dealing with the same thing they're dealing with just to get it off. What spaces do men have to talk about these things? You know, we don't, we don't go, uh, but if I'm going to watch uh, Golden State and the Celtics, man, I'm not talking about uh, the fact that my, my daughter's not speaking to me. She hasn't spoken to me to the last two days because I didn't compliment her when she came home with those new box braids. And I have to figure out a way to, you know, maybe take her on the trampoline in the back and jump with her or something. So it's things like that, you know, that um, when you talk about lived experiences um, that men, we just typically and fathers don't have an outlet to do it with. So as I talk about my project more, you'll see our hashtag is fatherhood is brotherhood. So what we're, you know, um, looking to do is build a brotherhood through fatherhood, through our commonality and so far so good. Yeah, and I think that the most successful programs are doing that. And that's, you know, in addition to identifying the pain point, it's the brotherhood that brings them back. If you can bring in a, a group of friends or, or family members or something like that into a group, that's a really strong group. That's, that's outstanding engagement um, because they know each other. They already have that. But when, you, when that's absent, just that's one of the things that we need to do as practitioners is to build a bond, you know, not only with, with us, but amongst each other. So setting the, the culture and the tone in the room and getting everybody on, on the same page uh, is, is vital. Um, I wanted to um, speak to another thing. Oh, okay, um, challenges, challenges. So obviously jobs, yes. Transportation, yes. Um, and I say jobs, it might be that they have a job. Their schedule doesn't allow them to participate. Um, you know, that's why, like Jeff is talking about finding the right opportunities, the right job, because maybe you have a schedule that doesn't allow you to do much else, but then just get by in, on your job. Um, and that's not a healthy lifestyle. It's not a good work life balance. So, um, you know, we do what we have to do as men, but we want to be put in position to where we can have a healthy life balance, which we really um, focus on a lot. Um, so that can be a barrier is, is the job, the working schedule. Um, other barriers could be, especially, you know, if this is somebody expecting a child, um, you know, it's a very busy time. It's very, very hectic, right? Um, so you have individuals that have a lot going on. Their focus, a lot of times, especially young dads, you got a baby coming, you think about the financial obligation. You think about what you have to do to be able to support this child, um, which is a blessing, but also a large expense that you did not have before. So um, I think it's that as well. So that that can be alleviated by helping them address some of those concerns as part of our programming. But I would say those are a couple that are definitely barriers in addition to, you know, transportation, housing, job, that's. Yeah, yeah. And I love this question here. It looks like Kamisha asked, how do you navigate fathers that are looking for child support assistance information? So I imagine you mean they're not looking to receive child support necessarily, but, you know, to potentially pay child support. It says it's a fine balance between, uh, to distance yourself from an agency that seeks child support, but you want to provide them with the resources needed to address barriers or concerns of, the, of that father. So I'll tell you how we look at it and how we think about it. So many times child support is, it has this negative connotation. I think the system has been sort of you know, um, theoretically rigged against men, you know, or to go after men, right? But how we explain it, guys, one of the things we do is um, we teach it. One of our uh, modules is um, system navigation, how to navigate systems, right? And so we're honest with these dads. We tell them that it's not that the system is against you. The system does what it's designed to do. It's not that the mother has more rights than you, right? What it is, is she just beat you to the courthouse. She handled, she handled your, her business. So what we talk about is radical responsibility. You know, you need to take responsibility. So we get rid of the narrative. In fact, we, I did a narrative intervention training for all my staff a few weeks ago. And I'm actually going to have a tool developed that helps dads when they come into our ecosystem to develop their narrative so they can tell their story the correct way. Because one story is, is always mom. She's crazy. 
how crazy was she when you met her? When you all dated, you all have a child together, but it's always this narrative that she's crazy, right? And so, you know, we talk about, so we don't allow those type of excuses. And what we also say, she's family. She'll be your family, whether, you know, and it's not you against her when you do go into this child support situation, you know, so we prepare them. You can't present yourself like that. You should never bad mouth your mom or your child's mother, you know, in front of anyone, you know, or no text messages, negative text messages. So it's the practical things that we do, but us, even a system like child support, we were fortunate enough to have, when we first started, a case manager who came out of the child support system. So he knew kind of the ins and outs. He, there are programs inside child support that a lot of people don't, don't know exist if you're in their arrears. And what you find with men in particular, I'll tell you, is in a sort of stereotypical, um, but when you appeal to the logic in men, hey, this is how that systems work. Or when I talk to a guy, say, hey, my, my case manager who was with child support for 10 years is going to have a conversation with you about your child support modification. You're allowed to um, have a child support modification review every 18 months, I believe. It might be 12 months um, based on income. Or you can also file for an emergency if your income changes or something drastic happens. You know, so men will take practical things like that and they'll repeat it back to you. Hey, uh, Mr. J, didn't you say I'd be eligible? You know, if I was to lose my job, yeah, you would. And so they're just things like that that I think really appeal to men to say, hey, I got a guy for that. You know, I got a guy who um who who will get you in there. They'll call you back. You know, so even as we talk about the partnerships being passed on, it's a lot different with Carl Root. Um, instead of him saying, "Hey, um, here's uh, here's the intake form over at Fathers Incorporated," he puts me on a text thread with the guy he wants to get in. Even me as the project director, because he knows it's going to get done, and I know if he's sending it to me, well, if Wesley is sending it to me, it's high priority. So that guy. Is going. Everyone gets excellent treatment, but he's going to get king treatment. He'll be responding to in a couple of days. If for some reason he doesn't hear back, they'll follow up. Now, I did call him, brother. Here's the text message. This is what I said. I'm waiting to hear back. So mm -hmm. when we talk about the barriers and partnerships and things like that, that that's really what it takes. Absolutely. Jeff, and I am being told to start my presentation. It's only a couple of slides. It's not going to take that long. We want to have plenty of time for questions. And while I'm sharing my screen and pulling that up, um, one thing that we found helpful, and I know Carl um, is familiar, um, we always would have somebody come in from child support, um, and he would speak about child support, and we just wanted to really um, learn about child support, how it actually works to take remove the fear, because, you know, fear is unknown, right? So um, when you don't know what's happening, you're more fearful of it. So um, we found that people were more comfortable with it when uh, they understood what would happen. And I always encourage that, you know, don't be afraid of child support because when you're afraid of child support, you're also afraid to enforce your visitation. You just don't want to show up to court, period, right? And we also let them know it's two different places. Anyways, all right, so Father Movement, here we are. So Father Movement is a direct service provider as well as a... Um, uh, father program consulting agency. Um, the way that we do our work is typically with um, 12 classes in a session. These classes um, are really based off of the 24 seven dad curriculum, which is supplemented pretty heavily more and more as we go along, um, trying to just make it more relevant to our dads. Um, we started off 12 sessions, which were dad only and found that we're speaking about moms a lot. For some of these dads, their biggest issues, right, that, that, uh, that hot point, that, that pain point is mom. So we need to get her in here. So we uh, started doing that, um, took it further in, in our efforts to build strong families and started doing couples coaching um, where we are covering skills helping them build a foundation. A lot of our families are not getting married. Um, there is no premarital counseling coming. You know, it's so it's just instant family. And sometimes it's compounded because now it's an instant family, but it's instant blended family. And I'm a part of a blended family. We did our counseling. <laughs> we had to. Um, I'm, I'm talking too much. I'm sorry, I'm going too long. Um, okay, so Project Dine, that's uh, eight part health nutrition study that's uh, investigating the um, impact fathers play on health and nutrition. 
And that's done with Morehouse School of Medicine in partnership with University of Georgia Cooperative Extension Office. Um, also, um, Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies, uh, we're now taking part in uh, breastfeeding classes, um, talking about support. Um, by no means are we um, as involved in that space as uh, Roe is, um, but uh, it's just something that uh, we were asked to do and we're happy to help out. And then we do outreach and marketing, and this is something that we're definitely going to have to, you know, uh, trade notes uh, with, with everybody, but, um, you know, folks on how do we reach these families, what are the best ways to do that, and I'll talk about that on the next slide, maybe a little more, and then workforce development, we do that as well, as I alluded to with the uh, apprenticeship, just trying to find training, your up skills for dads so they can have a, a wage that can support a family. This is a slide of one of our um, programs. We don't record our sessions. Um, we want dads to be able to speak freely. So um, this is just uh, one of the slides where we're trying to use something that's relatable. So we're talking here about empathy. Some people are familiar with the term, some not so much. But empathy, everybody knows empathy and has been asking for a long time. If you're from like the 2000s, 90s, like I am, it was feel me. You know, is yada, 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 feel, you know, like, do you understand? So empathy has been there for a long time. So trying to make it relatable. Um, and then I just have a case study here. So Atlanta Healthy Start, um, trying to uh, prop up this program and enhance it with uh, partnerships, both with uh, Atlanta Healthy Start and Father Movement, um, creating marketing campaigns designed mostly around special events. Um, giving people something to be excited about and uh, marketing not only to dads, but to moms as well. Um, what we found is a 42% increase in fathers uh, registering for the program, 300% increase in participation. And what we're doing is just meeting goals and having uh, the impact on these dads, which is what's really most important to us. Um, oh, and then just here's an example of that. Um, so we see this nice baby bump here, and um, this is just an example of an event where we're providing, we're leveraging resources, providing a cool event for um, people, and telling about the program and getting them enrolled, and building that sense of community, which is uh, something we're going to be doing more and more of as uh, whenever COVID lets us go. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to stop my share right now, and then uh, Carl, you let us know. Do you want Javid to present next or? Yes, yes, Javid, you can go ahead and present right now. And well, Chris, uh, you have a few, I was go gonna ahead. say Chris has a few questions in the chat. If uh, Chris, if you wanna check those out while Javid presents. Yeah. So here we go. All right. So, um, you know, just thinking about the fatherhood journey, I think, you know, all fathers, we're on, we're on a journey, but um, thinking about the young fathers that we're in contact with, the Fathers Incorporated. Um, these are some pictures. This actually is a picture of this main one from our graduation this weekend at Central Park right here in the middle of the city, Midtown Atlanta, you know, Fourth Ward. Um, so one of the questions I think we always ask is, you know, where are the dads, right? A lot of people want to know that. And so, um, the question I always say is who's asking, right? I think that that really matters and what's your lens? You know, there's a, um, you know, that is your story. I saw where, you know, it was a, a service person and um, they didn't see the dads that were coming in until somebody pointed it out. They felt like no dads would, you know, were there, but I think it's the lens that you're looking out of, you know, but dads may not be, they may be that kind of that shy puppy that comes around and may might not run straight into your arms, but you know, they're kind of hanging around, but we've certainly found that the dads are around, they've responded to our message. So I'm thinking about um, our recruitment and our graduation success in year two, we've had over 756 intakes. And what I'll say is one of the things I found that I alluded to earlier is that radio still really works. So um, I'm a marketing guy kind of by training. And so what I did, I wrote some ad copy that really, really resonated with our population. And uh, you know, I tweaked a few things again, as I told you all, just making sure we're hitting the right dads that, that, we, that we knew we could serve. And so once we found that, that right ad, you know, we would run it. And so what I would do is I'd run ads two weeks before our cohort and, uh, you know, during the cohort, the last two weeks before our cohort would end. And so we get these numbers in. So what we found is our goal has been 800 intakes. Um, 
from um, September 30th through um, this coming October. That, that's what our goal was. And right now we're already at 756 intakes. And so I stopped radio. I have not run radio since March because I knew we were approaching what our numbers were. But now things are sort of on autopilot. Now we get tons of referrals from graduates. Um, we still have partners that make referrals to us. And we also have a evergreen Facebook um, ad that really works. But what happens is when guys see themselves, this bottom right picture here is another dad from one of our graduations earlier in the year. But when these dads see themselves or hear themselves in your ad, um, to the point that Chris was making that that they feel you, you know, and they'll respond. It's no question. But um, 366 dads enrolled in our program this year. Again, our goal of having 200 graduates. Uh, right now, we have 143 graduates, and I have 93 in process waiting for a July cohort. And so, essentially, I told my team what we've done. We've sprinted to these cohorts, and um, kind of in these last couple months, we'll pull back and we'll look at our year three which will start October 1st, and we're gonna improve our process some. But one cool thing I always bring up at graduation, I do a fun thing where I'll ask the audience members, just say if we have, I think we had 39 graduates this past weekend, how many children do you think that these 39 dads represent? You know, um, and I think the number was 88. I believe those 39 dads who graduated were responsible for 88 children. So you talk about impact and culture, impact and society, this is the way to do it. You know, and so we ask for another funny thing. We, do, we give out what we call our Big Pop Award. And you all Biggie Smalls fans, we play that Big Pop song. So whoever has the most children, we present them with a plaque. And one guy had, his name was Hollywood. He had 10 children. But he sat up there, he named them all, named all of his children. You know, five or six were there today. In fact, he, he brought 15 people to the graduation. We looked at the RSVP. He had 15, so we understood why. So... Those are some things, but when we look at some of the uh, studies that are out here, what we can see is um, in the last decade, <clears throat> fathers are becoming more and a lot more involved in their children's lives in the last 10 years. You know, I think there are myriad of things. I think daddy hunger is one where fathers, you know, fatherless children are now having children. They know how it felt. You know, I think some things are changing, you know, legally, I think awareness, you know, societal things are changing where it just isn't cool, you know, not to be there for your children, you know, in a way, even if you don't live in the same household. Um, I think one of the challenges that, that um, we sort of talked about or somebody asked in the chat was, you know, look at it, co-parenting is in crisis. I think that's one of the biggest things. Like Chris said, that pain point oftentimes can be the child's mother. Many times it's just perspective and it's just age. If you give, you know, if you give people, you know, some time, you know, give them ability and give them an environment to grow in, what you'll find is that these things work themselves out. They may be at this hot flash point right now when they just broke up. You won't get to see your child, you know, give it some time. One of the things I think that Robe is doing really innovatively um, is involving the dad from day zero, right? You're helping him understand what his role should be, even when it comes to maternal and child related health. I think that's something that's really, really important. You're building a bond with that child before they get there, but you're also building that bond with mom, where dad doesn't think his responsibility is only to take the kid to the park and to provide, you know, um, you know, uh, monetary support, but you understand some of the responsibilities and it also builds, Chris's word, it builds empathy for the mom. One thing I learned in our teaching my curriculum to the teen dads was that you cannot abuse somebody if, if you call them by their name. It'd be really hard for me to call you Chris and punch you in your face. But if mm -hmm. I call you a punk or whatever it might be, it's a lot easier for me to do that. But I think the activities that role is involved in, they're building this level of empathy for these fathers that they'll have for their mothers, you know, have for the uh, for the child's mother. So that's something we also try to get to, but we rely on partnerships to sort of help us, you know, do some of those things we're not great at. Um, additionally, our cohort style support groups. One thing that I think people don't understand is the emotional toil that it takes on fathers when they're separated from their children. We have cases where my dad may have had, you know, maybe not legal custody, but he had an agreed custody with the mom. Some mom, she wanted to run off, move to another state to be with a boyfriend. You know, she came back three years later. This dad has been raising this little girl and she comes back and just takes the girl just to be spiteful, drops off at the grandmother's every week, you know, just to keep them away. So those are situations like that when this fatherhood is brotherhood piece comes in because 
it's no law, it's no anything that can help him except the emotional support as he goes through what he's going to need to, you know, kind of traverse to get his parenting rights put in place. Here in Georgia, very few people know there's a legitimation law in place that if a father, um, if a couple is unwed when they have that child, the father has zero parental rights, um, paternal rights until he goes through this legitimation process, which can cost up to $5,000 if you hire an attorney to file. That's something as these guys go through our cohort, we start during the uh, cohort process, but we have case managers and volunteer lawyers. Again, um, another partnership with legal aid where we help these guys do the paperwork themselves, you know, um, with volunteer attorneys. Um, the third thing I think we have to think about is uh, systems incentivizing fatherhood. When we get to that place where systems recognize the power of fatherhood and begin to incentivize fatherhood, I think we'll see a larger change. Um, and on my, I think it's my last slide you'll see momentarily. We'll see some things that sort of make dads tick, to kind of get dads going. But uh, we've always already talked about this last bullet, just the partnership, because while the dad need, dads need support, us as practitioners, we need support and we need that brotherhood with each other. But in thinking about what fathers need, they need affirmation and acknowledgement that they're doing a really good job. One thing you'll see this, this stat that's right here, my screen is sort of covered, but statistics show that regardless of a father's skill set, they'll still report themselves as doing um, not that great of a job of raising their kids because what's their measuring stick? I think moms have tons of measuring sticks, you know, out there. Tell moms how great of a job they do. I think some of the things dads may do may not show up, you know, on the stat sheet always. But, you know, an um, active dad, we all we definitely know when you when you dig into the data of how, um, you know, children are less likely to offend that their school performance, you know, less suicide rates with dads being involved. There are absolutely some things that point to the job we do, but we may not understand it themselves. Um, and I think what organizations like Chris and Robe and other father serving organizations out here are providing is an environment to thrive. We don't have to necessarily solve every, every problem, but you just put these dads in an environment where they get to be them be their best selves again. Respect is huge, you know, coming in. One thing I do, one of my recruitment strategies, when I'd want to get a guy to participate, it's a tough thing to say, hey, you need to come in and learn this curriculum we developed in-house versus There'll be some 18 year old dads on the phone that needs to hear from you. I say, understand your dad has been divorced for two years. You probably have some insights to share that um, that these younger dads would appreciate. And it's true. You know, everyone has a story on um, expectations. You know, what do you expect of these dads? You know, um, how can we measure what you're doing? The proudest thing, and it's funny, we had to change our system at the graduation. You're looking here would take so long to announce all of our perfect attendance guys that we had to begin to put them in the back there, um, you know, put their letter of perfect attendance, you know, behind the uh, whatever else they would get their graduation. Um, we'd have to put it behind it. So guys would run up to the table afterwards, say, hey, where's my uh, perfect attendance certificate? I said, it's right behind us. We had 30, 40 guys, I think it was about out of the 39, I think we had 34 that had perfect attendance, you know. Um, and then lastly, the point you always hear me uh, speak about is just the brotherhood, it's the support, you know, it's uh, men having safe space to be together to talk about, you know, things that we're dealing with, you know, it's not, necess it's not necessarily locker room talk, it's just safe space talk that I think men really need, um, you know, that space to do. Um, and lastly, um, again, I invite you all to visit our website, fatherhoodisbrotherhood.com to see some of the work that we're doing. And um, I really just put this up to sort of illustrate some of the successes that we've had, but we've already talked about. I know this is really small, but um, OFA, um, what their requirements are for us. I told you to serve 200 dads. Of that, they want 90% to complete. You see, we've already uh, smashed that goal. We have 113% completion with three months uh, left in the program year. Uh, completed clients, 105%. Those are the 90% um, that have done 100% attendance. Um, halfway attendance, those who have done 50% attendance, we're at 90% already, initial attendees, 94%. So I say all to say it really does work. You know, um, I know a lot of people on this call are passionate about the work that they do. Um, and again, thinking about our partnerships and just building systems. So I'm not sure if any questions came in from me, um, but I'm gonna stop sharing now. Okay, and um, we're gonna drop an evaluation in the chat so you can uh, please fill out the evaluation. But also let me say 
as you can hear from the presentations that the, the ecosystem, this space where we serve at reaching our brothers everywhere and our mission is rich. And because of the work that they're doing on the other side, say the men that we serve, especially working with teen fathers, as J Javin mentioned, we work with 13 to 19 year old dads and they know very little about life in general. So they're really being taught. I used to ask the young men, you know, what are you going to do, man? Did you expect to have a child? No, but Ruth, we were just smashing. Okay, well, yeah, unprotected. You can have a baby. You can get a life-changing or life-ending disease. But anyway, at that age, they're young. Uh, in the space where Javin and Chris serve, they have an older, uh, more mature male. But for us, we're on the prevention side of things like it's better to place a net or a fence at the edge of the cliff than an ambulance at the bottom of it. So from a preventive perspective, we talk about when, you when you're involving a dad and feeding choices, you're enhancing a relationship. You're building a bond. You've got a man who's bought in and he's more able to be invested in the relationship because now you're talking about breastfeeding with a man that have issues like child support, unemployment, housing, issues, barriers, criminal justice, justice involved, all of these different barriers. So we're talking about stuff that's at the back end, but when you get at the front end, you can eliminate a lot of that back end stuff by just teaching relationship skills, parenting skills, self-development skills in general. So, and that's what we do. We're so glad to be a part of the ecosystem where we come in for Javin and Chris and provide that maternal and child health education, that breastfeeding, that breastfeeding, that uh, safe sleep information. And it's rich for us. So we're excited about it. Thank you, Javin and Chris. You all have been excellent this evening. Thank you for doing what you do. And we appreciate all of you who have attended. But uh, please, questions. And while you're forming your questions, one thing I always want to stress in situations like this, sometimes agencies assume dads aren't involved. Um, but we found, like I, I can think of one particular um, Healthy Start organization, Kyle Douglas, when they looked at a report, they found that 70% of moms self-reporting having dads involved. And we know that if you're dealing in that space, a dad had to be involved at some point in time in order for the woman to be pregnant, right? So if he's not involved, he was probably involved last month. So um, that's just another thing to keep in mind that we have to always challenge that idea that the men aren't there because they definitely are. I saw um, one important point that someone made. Let me see if I can find it. It's Barbara. Also with the increase in the maternal mortality rates, the dad's biological custodian have to increase their involvement. I think that's a really fair point. I have a, uh, a younger cousin in Chicago who just had a child last week and she was rushed to the hospital um, a couple of days ago with high blood pressure. So I know that's something that's really, really real. You know, um, we do have several single dads in our ecosystem. I think that's also something that, that should be lifted up, you know, where, um, you know, single dads who are, because I can imagine it's an immense challenge, but I also think during those times, men grow a greater respect as we talk about empathy for the role of moms, you know, as nurturers or whatever role they may take on in that, you know, in, in that family, whatever the dynamic may be. But I think that's a very fair point, you know. Um, and in fact, uh, Brother Ruth, what I'll send out to you, the uh, uh, National Responsible Fatherhood Clearinghouse has a documentary coming out, dedication. I think it actually drops today there on a webinar today. I'm going to send that to you all so you can share with the group. But there's an amazing young single father who, who's, um, he, was, he was actually incarcerated. He was in prison when he came out. His wife had passed while he was in prison. And the judge really worked with him to make sure he got custody of his daughter and he tells his story, but that's an excellent point. I saw a really, really good question. How are you providing services to grieving dads? So when I think of grieving, I think obviously the loss of a child, but I also think about the loss of a child due to custody. Okay, so there's, there's two ways in which we do that. And I would say uh, for a loss of a child, not having that experience, I do lean on partnerships, okay? So there's a really good organization called Trust Your Strength that um, deals directly with that. They focus a lot on like um, uh, premature babies, 
and both those that have made it and those have not. But so they, they do have um, support groups for that. Um, and then um, as far as dads that haven't had access to their children, you know, having experienced some of that, that's something that's, yeah, that we deal with and, and through our support groups. And especially like somebody like that um, can address it in a group, but also it's one-on-one, -on -one, you know, working with that. Sometimes dads have such an urgent need that they need, you know, they need to be called on, they need to be met with, and we need to have that one-to-one -one relationship with them. Yeah. What I say to that, I think dads are grieving in so many different ways, you know, and I, um, I say it's akin to a farmer. Imagine if you were a farmer, you planted, you know, a garden, beautiful flowers, um, you spent all of this time nurturing, you had thoughts about it, and it's just kind of innately, it was your gift, something you wanted to do, and then all of a sudden, <clears throat> two months before the flowers blossom, then, you, then you're taken someplace and they say, you'll never get to see these flowers. You know, you, you'll never see them. You don't even know about, don't ask. In fact, you need to send some money back because we need to buy new soil, but don't worry about seeing the flowers. We're afraid you'll step on them. You'll break them. We already know what you do, right? And so I think men are grieving, and you know, so many of them, I'm even gonna say, I think I know so many men are grieving, you know, for the separation and for kind of, I think, and their fatherhood dying where they're not getting the chance to be a father that they thought they could be. You know, mm -hmm. I think you have to address that on the mental health side also. All right. Have we answered the questions in the chat? Are we ready for, we got a couple of minutes, a couple of more questions see um one question about curriculum do you have any curriculum that engages male children and teens uh the reason i ask is women are generally socialized to be nurturing caretakers from a young age therefore there are many women who do not want cannot have children but they're still actually aunties my husband and i frequently praise our boys for their for their kindness um and jazz javin i uh through fathers incorporated your organization i was able to get trained on the connect curriculum for teens, for parents who have teens. It's an excellent curriculum. And I provided that information in the uh, chat. Awesome. Nice. Um, there's another one as well. Um, shoot, it, it just moved on me. It was a great question um, towards the end. Let's see. Uh, deal with dad's depression and the stigma is huge. Oh man, I, honestly, we talk about that. I don't, not on every single meeting, but very, very often we're talking about mental health. Um, and then of course we do focus on it directly. We do bring in therapists. Um, I tell them the group is therapeutic, right? Both, both for me when I'm leading a class and, and when I'm participating in a class, um, it's very therapeutic. However, if you want to speak to somebody um, more directly to your issue, you definitely need to talk to them. So we bring the therapist to them and make that connection. And then we're praising uh, bravery, right? We're looking at an involved dad, an involved man in the way that you tackle your emotions because you know prior generations buried them away. We could feel anger and that was about it. But now we talk about, well, why don't you feel these things? And is it a scary thing to you? And if it is something that's scary to you, is it manly to not express those scary things, to not even go there? Um, so, so we're always challenging that, that stigma in our groups. Excellent, excellent. You know, one thing I'll say, um, which I think we're gonna focus on for year three, I imagine there are people on the call who are kind of in that medical space, um, you know, uh, whether it's nurses, you know, I know the work that Robe and Rose do. Um, but one thing we want to see is, what we found with the younger dads, we still have issues engaging these younger dads, 18 to 23. And so we've been trying to figure out why. And what we believe is, is that like the old people used to say, just keep on living. You know, these 18 to 23 years probably have not experienced, you know, the, uh, the conflict, you know, coming between them and the child's mother, yet the relationship is, is sort of new. And so that's one thing we found is that if a dad is not experiencing that heartache, there's not some issue, he may not stick either. If everything is going, you know, really well at the time, he may not think he needs legitimation. He needs to activate his parental rights because they got a good thing going. Oh, she would never do that to me. But it's not until 
you know, I met a guy at Greenbrier Mall, you know, one of the malls here on the south side, and he eventually called us back. He said, oh, no, I don't have those kind of issues. And he eventually called us back, you know. So um, I think one of the things we want to look at at some point is early on is getting deeper in the work that Robe is doing. How do we get these referrals, you know, from these younger dads who may be involved and they're not in this situation? How can our curriculum help prevent them from going down this path, because what, what's going to happen, you know, when you enter into a new relationship, you guys decide to separate, can you still keep it together? So those are some things we're looking at in year three, as well as using our alumni base to help keep our fathers engaged, you know, mm -hmm. for the long haul. Yep. Well said. I don't see any other questions, Carl. Okay. No more questions for all practical purposes. Our session's done. We're ready to leave here. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for your insight and for sharing with our panel, for sharing as panelists and for the group that was here, all of those who joined us this evening on the call. Thank you so much. I hope we shared something that is not only life-changing, but life-giving. And uh, as we continue to work in this field of responsible fatherhood, we pray that the outcome of our work will be fewer maternal and infant childhood of mortality. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, guys.